And Charlie, ask your question. Yes, the state actor, Apris, and others recommended to get your mite treatment on early as, as soon as July or 1st of August. Yet most of the mite treatments have temperature restrictions. And the higher the temperature, the chances are going to kill some or more bees. Would you comment on that? Sure. And so it's a, it's a really good question. It's, is that it's pretty clear that what you want to do with your mite treatments is get them in as soon as you can. And by as soon as you can, that means right after your last honey flow has been removed. Um, the problem, of course, in, in some areas like this is that that's when it's hottest outside. And so thymol and formic acid can cause damage to the brood. So what, what do you do? Formic acid can be pretty bad with the, with the uncapped brood, and you'll lose a lot of uncapped brood. But we did do a study when I was still in Pennsylvania where we looked at that, and yeah, you can see that the brood gets cut down. But the bees, all those nurse bees are all charged up. They've got a lot of milk, you know, that they want to feed those larvae. And so the colonies usually rebound from that, even so that two months out, the populations are equal, if not higher, in the colonies that were damaged slightly. So some of that damage looks terrible, but the bees more than compensate. Having said that, formic acid I think you want to be especially careful with is that it can really wipe out your colonies or it can take the colonies right out. And in those cases, I would leave some ventilation. And that's where you have to, you're going off label a little bit, where you want to leave a little ventilation so that you don't have it completely sealed. So that you, you sort of leave a gap between your brood chambers a bit so the bees are better able to fumigate that formic acid out. Most of the treatment that you get from formic acid happens within the first 24 hours because there's a real big flush of the formic acid into the system. And so that's getting under the cappings and damaging the brood and all of that stuff. Um, so just opening it up a bit so some of that can get ventilated out is the option. But it's a really good question. Did you speak up? In addition to what you was asking, Right. I, I think that that's, that's another really good question. With formic acid, I'm more familiar with formic acid here because we used to get a machine that you could stick into the hive and take the parts per million out. So the question is, what happens if you treat, it's below 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and then three days later it's 100 degrees. With the formic acid, the big flush of forming occurs within the first 24 hours. So I wouldn't be so concerned about the 100 degree day two or three days later. If you are concerned about it, open it up a bit. Let, 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 let some of it, because this is a gas chamber. And so all you're doing is you're opening it up a bit so some of that gas can get up, out, out of there. previous forming treatment. You know, with pads, you had to close that up. But um, but in looking on their website, you can actually leave your screen bottom or your screened bottoms open and that would certainly help with ventilation. Although the fumes drop, right? Right. Yeah. Right. right. So are you saying on the website, is that saying it on the label too? Yeah, I'm not sure, but yeah. I did see on the There's website. There's an awful lot that's on the miter with one of the problems with, with the formic acid. Um, one of the one of the problems with the formic acid company in in Canada, Dog, is that they say a whole bunch of things that aren't on the label, and it's a little bit frustrating. And I think that the the take home is is you have to go home and and and, and sort of figure some of these things out. Um, they're saying that. You know, in some cases, use half a dose, cut the, the, the pad in half, and apply that, which might be something to do if it's really hot as well. But these are all, this, this then isn't a standard product. I mean, these things act as, if it was really hot, I would prefer to use thymol over formic. If you were really concerned about the heat, use thymol. 
Right now, in the fall, I think Formic is a really good option. So if I had to treat right now, I would treat with Formic. If it was the middle of the summer, um, and I wasn't going to be producing another honey crop, I would think about thymol. I think I think the Formic does a lot more damage at hot temperatures.
that case, it sounds like, you know, I think the rule in the Philadelphia area was, um, you know, July 4th weekend, you put your treatment on. But I think you want to start thinking about a treatment in September or after your September flow. And what, what I do is, is, is I, I, I put on treatment in September, and then I put on Change the subject a little bit. What do you know about this new mite? And are you anticipating that entrance out of the United States? Well, the chocolate labs mite. Well, I wouldn't say anticipating. I would I would say that we're concerned that it's one it's on the radar for one of the things. So the National Honeybee Disease Survey. The reason we have the money for it is because we're getting requests from Chile and different countries in Australia to import bees from those countries to help meet the California almond. And the only reason, the only way you can prevent importation of bees from another country by WTO law is to say you have something that we don't. So we have this, we're doing this National Honeybee Disease Inspection Program to show that we don't have certain things. So we're showing, which is theoretically impossible to do, but it's still you work, you work in gray. And so we're showing that we don't have trouble a last night. In order to do that, there was no real good test for it, and so we actually had to go to Thailand to figure out these tests. And so these mites are not supposed to be able to live on the bees. They only live in the brood. So we think, well, that's great. We won't have a problem then in northern, in northern countries or in northern things because we have periods of broodlessness. You can treat them and get rid of them all. Unfortunately, the North Koreans, who have a very cold winter, not the North Koreans, South Koreans, yeah, you're not working with North Koreans, the South, Koreans, the South Koreans have big periods of brutalness and have trochlelaps mites. So obviously the trochlelaps mites are able to do it. They reproduce really, really quickly. Um, so much so that, as I said, they're treating every two weeks for these mites because these mites just go out of control. The fact is that we don't know anything about these mites. We don't know a lot about them at all. And so I think that that's one of the, that's one of the we have a big meeting starting on Monday and Tuesday, where we're looking at the, UN, the, at the USDA level, we're trying to prioritize what the research priorities have to be for the next five years. And this is one that I would advocate, is we need to be prepared for some of these unknowns. Because if you think about it, it's always the unknowns that, that really scare us. You know, tracheomites, then varroa mite, then small hive beetle. And we can figure out how to deal with them, sometimes well and sometimes not well. We can figure it out. So I think it's trying to be prepared ahead of time is the goal there. So it's an interesting mite because it's, its biology is not very well known, um, but it certainly can reproduce really quickly. External? Yeah, it's an external mite. It's interesting, in, in South Africa, that all the bees, they have varroa mite there and they don't treat for varroa mite at all. And so you end up seeing a lot of bee louse, which we had a lot of in this country before we had varroa mite, but now that we treat for varroa mite, we don't see bee louse at all. And so there are the other sort of pests that are sort of back of it. But if you've ever seen a bee louse, it looks a lot like a bee louse. On the bee form, when you fill out the survey, you can say that you have other types of hives beside a Langstroth hive. Do you know how many people have are keeping different types of hives beside Langstroths? So, so with the bee Inform project, what we're doing is we're trying to automate the responses. So next year, you can get the results like within two weeks of the being done. For that to happen, we need to have at least ten people respond. We have never had more than ten people respond to one of the different really? different different hive styles, yeah. and so the results are just not, are not, are not a thing. I will say with the Bee Informed Project, and I, I wouldn't mind if, if you guys want, I can show you just some other information from the Bee Informed Project here in a minute. But um, 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 I think that one of the things that it's, it's showing is that the problem with it right now is it's only, did you do this, yes or no? But for, the real interesting thing is, did you do this and this? 
Did you do this? And these other three things. But for you to be able to get that sort of data, you need about 10,000 data points. And so we've had two years in a row, we've had about 8,000 data points so far. Next year we'll have 10,000. So we're really just borrowing, we have a cancer epidemiologist on this, and we're just borrowing the science used to try to figure out risk factors with cancer um, in order to, to, show, to show some of this stuff. So we're, we're getting, I think we're working towards that. It's just, this is really, you can imagine, we have this many people in this room, you can imagine how everyone's story is different. And so trying to tease these things out are really difficult. Unless you have a lot of data. We were having a discussion at our table about fall management and do you take the brood chamber and put it in the bottom box so that they can display honey across the top and all that. If you go and look at the Merrick guide, it does describe that type of activity. We were curious what you thought of that. Right. And secondarily, does anybody in this room know if the Merrick is still going and if they ever intend to update their fact sheets and things like that? I don't know that you would know that answer, but maybe well, somebody I, knows. I think, Jim, do you know about Merrick? Yeah, they're having a I think the guide was written in 2002 or three or something like that. It's it's pretty old. What's that? Maybe planning paper or research? Something in that it's university, Penn State. Yeah, it's it's Delaware now. It's been in Delaware. West Virginia's in it. But I think the whole West Virginia is now Delaware. It's not Penn State anymore. Oh. Is that right? It really has quite a few fact sheets that are interesting to follow or whatever, but you know, they make reference to different treatments that I think have fallen by the wayside. It needs to be updated, so. Yeah, yeah. The, the, your president, president of New Jersey should be on that. He should, be some he should have a In terms of, of, of orienting your, your feet, so the theory is, and I think it's true, is that bees move up. And so the idea is that if you have all your bees in the top of the chamber and a lot of honey at the bottom, they could still start because they like to move, to move up. Um, I think that becomes very, very important in New York and northern latitude states. I don't know what I consider this area. I mean, it seems like I don't know where you are. I think that you could. If you were a very diligent beekeeper, I bet you could get through the winter with one brood chamber if you were feeding it to fondants or some other source of food, that you probably don't need two chambers here, because I can't imagine they need that if you're aggressive about feeding. Um, I do think that there is merit to keeping them, to keeping the brood chamber low and the honey above, because they're going to move up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I've been seeing a lot of this year a lot of small hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, any new treatments or anything new coming up right. uh, that you're aware of right. uh, in helping control small hygiene? So, so the issue of small hygiene was an interesting one because it sort of goes through a couple phases. The first is total alarm, where you call, I have a small hygiene, my operation is going to completely die. And then you tell people, no, 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 you just have to manage the beetle in your honey house. There are problems in your honey house. That's where they're going to damage comb. You just have to be very aggressive about not letting... Small hive beetle are basically wax moth on steroids. They're going to destroy your comb in three days rather than the two weeks wax moth they're going to. So really, if you know how to manage small hive beetle, of course wax moth, that is keep your colony strong and healthy and extract your honey supers really quickly. You don't tend to have a problem. And then you enter the next phase, which is where you start seeing beetles. And you see a lot of adult beetles. And these beetles undoubtedly are always in the corner of your acre in the patch of shade. 
And there are, I've opened up hives, and you can't see the top bar for beetles. I mean, there's just thousands and thousands of these beetles. The, the thing about them is, is that, that the bees are able to corral these beetles in propolis chambers and all this stuff. The beetles are actually able, if you look at a bee, they have a little thing that hangs between their mandibles, and if you hit it, well, you could hit it, but if a, if a small hive beetle hits it, the bee regurgitates. So the, bees, the beetles actually milk the bees for nectar, and so that's how they're able to survive in these chambers. And uh, if you ever open a hive, then you get a lot more beetles in the next day because they can smell, they aggregate together. We used to say that these weren't a problem. The adult beetles aren't a problem because the bees are able to manage them. There's now some evidence. We know that the beetles can overwinter in the brood chain or the, the cluster. And we think that the small hive beetles disturb the cluster, um, which reduces mortality. So people who use small hive beetle traps tend to have less colony mortality than those who don't use small hive beetle traps. Now there was a bait that the USDA in Beltsville, in Gainesville, Florida developed. And this bait, it ends up that these beetles have inside their, inside a special pouch in their throat, they have a place that they grow all these fungus and yeast. And they spit this up in the comb, in the pollen. And that smell of rotting pollen attracts other beetles. And so one thing that you can do is if you really want to trap beetles, they were going to market this and then they realize it's easy to make yourself, is if you have a bunch of pollen patties or some other protein source, and you stick a bunch of adult beetles on there and let them start making it like rotting and the beetles, get rid of those beetles, put that in a little bag and you put that in a trap, something like the traps you use for the, um, what are those called? Yeah. Yeah, the Japanese beetles, you put some of that bait in, you'll catch a lot of adult beetles in those traps that way. So it's just that you want it to start fermenting, and then that attracts a lot. The in-hive traps can collect a lot. You know, the other option that people are doing is that they're they're making trap like pesticide cards and putting them in the bottom. I wouldn't do any of that. I think that I don't think that they're high enough risk to do that. I think if you want to trap them aggressively, but I think that they're a pest. They're probably a problem in that one, get your colonies in the sun if you can. I think that helps reduce it. If you're still going to see them, you can trap them out. I think that's the best recommendation right now. Um, they're more of a problem than stored equipment, so you have to just treat that stored equipment. Right, yeah, and these hive beetles, especially right after a rain, they fly, they fly, I think it was eight or nine kilometers. So they fly a long distance. I mean, I don't think, I think you're saying they'll draw them in. The question is, would they come in anyway? And so that's, that's the possibility, that they'll be flying in anyway. Would you recommend leaving the oil catcher traps in the hive No. I don't know why, but I would <laughs> Should you recommend keeping the oil traps in the hive over the winter? No, I, mean, I don't know why, but I would. <laughs> Anyone else have an opinion on that? Oh. Excuse me. Are the relationship to the sun what is, that is most important, or is it the relationship to a moist location? In other words, moisture in the soil, moisture in shade, uh, you want your to basically be on drier land. Is that associated with the lesser problem? I, I guess the answer is I don't know, and I don't know that anybody knows. I think the answer is is that the colonies, like if you find these beetles, they're always on the top bar. And if you're in full sun, I think it gets really hot up there. And that's not the, the least ventilated thing. So I'm not sure it's the moisture so much as the shade, that it's the cooler, it's the cooler option. But I don't know. The moisture, I think, becomes much more important for, say, chalk root disease and other things like that. If I remember correctly, you've done a lot of research in the past on colony collapse. Anything new coming on the plate with that, or is it so? So colony collapse disorder is interesting because we, we it lost a lot of colonies 2006, 2007, some more in 2008. 
since then we've been having a very hard time finding any colonies that have colony collapse disorder. And when I talk about colony collapse disorder, I'm talking about a very specific set of symptoms. Rapid loss of the adult population, no invasion of, of um, robbers or parasites like small hive beetle or um, wax moth. Um, the queen is there, there's food stores there. So that classic case of colony collapse disorder, we haven't seen. So it's actually done exactly what you'd expect for an emerging disease. You see high levels of it, and it peters off. So we don't know. What we do know is that we know that the CCDVs were very, very sick, so they had all the pathogens going, but there wasn't a common pathogen. And we do think that that symptom of colonies, um, of colonies totally leaving the colony, and no dead bees in the bee yard or bee yard, or beehive or the bee yard, is in fact um, a, a, is a, a, a response to stress. And so what we think happens, we see this in termites, for instance. So when a termite gets a fungal infection, it leaves the colony and it tells other termites that I'm sick by pounding on the ground with a leopard's walk. So it's a very, it's a special walking beat that they make, you know, boom, 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 boom. And so all the other termites don't touch it and then. So it's altruistic suicide. So what we think is the bees somehow know they're sick and they fly out to die away from the holly to protect the nest mates. Of course, in this case, everyone's sick, so everyone's flying out en masse. And so we think that explains the symptom. What we don't understand is the underlying reason for why these bees were so susceptible to being ill. Um, and there's some debate about that, whether it's multiple factors or single factor. That's a really good question too. I was I was asked that a little earlier. So, is there a direct connection between the problem with the bees and industrial agriculture? So, monoculture basically. So, one of the reasons that bees are used as pollinating units, extensively as they they are, is because they're movable. So, there's no other pollinator that you can get 40,000 bees in a box or pollinators in a box, stick it on a truck, and move it to the next cropping system. And the reason that has advantages is because the crop is in bloom for a two week period, you get the bees in, then they need to start spraying with the pesticides that would kill them. You can move them out and move them to another crop. And so in a way, honeybees, the reason honeybees are so important for pollinators is because they work well in managed agricultural crops. Having said that, there is a lot of concern about the fact that um, that there's a lot of decreased forage for bees, and we saw that this morning in that graph, where we're seeing total land use for, you know, forage, bee forage has decreased, and, and certainly that variety of diet is not there for bees anymore, and so that's that's a concern. It's interesting also to note that we've done a study that we're just working on publishing right now, where we had colonies of. of of bees in different cropping systems to collect the pollen to look at the pesticide loads in these different cropping systems. In all of the cases of apples, the majority of pollen that the bees brought in were not from the crop that they were there to pollinate from. So a lot of the, the, the pollen that these bees are bringing in are from, from that, three, that, that three kilometer range that these bees fly. And also, it's likely that some of these wheat patches in these other places have high levels of pesticides. Who do you think who do you think uses the most pesticides in this country per acre? Hector? Homeowners. Homeowners. Homeowners use 30 times more pesticides per acre than farmers do on average. And so that's some of the concern we have. And the labeling instructions for homeowners is much different than, than otherwise. And so we're we're thinking that some of these exposures might not be in the agricultural sector. There might be other routes of exposure that need to be concerned. The other thing is that we often blame pesticides, and when we think about pesticides, we think about insecticide. But by far, the biggest body of evidence that are indirectly causing mortality in bees is fungicides right now. That we have a lot more evidence that fungicides are causing a problem than insecticides. And in part, that's because there's no 
no ban on spraying fungicides because we don't think it hurts bees. So they can spray fungicides while they're in bloom and everything. And if you think about it, bees, when they're out in the, in the forge, they collect this pollen, and they collect the pollen and they bring it back into the colony, and then they have to put it in, the, in that comb, and it's bee bread. And to make it bee bread, they add yeasts. And these yeasts help ferment the bee bread and release the fat and release the, the protein in there from the shell, because that pollen is a real hard shell. But then these fungicides are getting in there and killing those yeasts so that the pollen isn't as digestible by, to the bees as otherwise. So, so the, the whole story of this, of what bees are exposed to, is a really complicated story. Just tag on to the CCD story. Colonies that were healthy had by far much more pesticides than colonies that had CCD. And so it's exactly opposite to what we, we would have expected if pesticides were a ruling cause. And so one of the things that we're thinking is that there might be lines of bees that are more resistant to pesticide than others. And so if you have a line of bees that isn't very resistant to pesticides, you suddenly become much more susceptible to what's happening in the environment. I think some of this is inadvertently um, a result of some of the queen rearing, because the queen rearers have stopped using pesticides in their colonies to control, especially their drone producing colonies and their, their breeder lines, in order to control varroa. They're really trying not to use some of these hard pesticides. And so there's no exposure there at all. These bees have had no exposure to the real world. And when they get into the real world colonies, there's so many pesticides that this might be some of our problem. There's a very complicated, and none of the stories are direct. There's none of them, not once have I guessed something was happening and been right. It always sort of does this convoluted story. So I haven't answered your question, but I wave my hands a lot again. Yeah. <laughs> So chlorthaladin is a fungicide. It's used an awful lot in the blueberries to prevent fungus, like pyrethroid. No, pyrethroid. What's the, what's the, you know that white fungus that grows on everything? Starts with the fusarium. Yeah, fusarium. So you see that on strawberries and stuff. A lot of fungicide gets used. There's a lot of like apple rot and a lot of fungicides get sprayed while they're blooming because some of the funguses will get into the bloom and cause apple rot and these different things. So fungicide is used pretty extensively. So it's in a, in a fruit bunch. Yeah, it's used in fruit, a lot of fruit, fruit, fruit oh, orchards and blueberries. Yeah, I think so. Well again, yeah, you see a lot of Yeah, strawberries. I think strawberries and all these soft fruits use a lot of fungicides. Strawberries one of the worst. Yeah. Grapes and stuff. Yeah. So it's a good question. West Nile spray, West Nile, they're controlling West Nile virus, so they're spraying at night to kill the mosquitoes. And so what's the effect on honeybees? So I can only answer from my experience at, Pens at, at PDA, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, where they did the same thing. The product they use, and I'm sure it's the same product here, breaks down very, very, very quickly in sunlight. And it requires direct contact. So unless this bee from your colony flies out mat, like hours from sunset and manages to roll around in a lot of different plants, its exposure risk is very, very low. So it doesn't seem, the only problem is, is if you, it's very hot and your bees are bearded and they spray directly on it, you can get some loss. But I think that generally speaking, it's a very low risk pesticide. Yeah. Yeah. It breaks down really fast in sunlight.
So spraying for ticks. I think that the real risk is that you want that they should be spraying ticks on blooming plants, and I think it's illegal for them to be spraying blooming plants anyway. Like that's on all the labels. You're not allowed to spray on blooming plants. So if they're spraying the lawn and there's nothing blooming there, then the the the, the possible route of exposure seems very low. for death by one of the neonicotinoids. Yeah. So, so, so a neonic, an acute toxic, kills the bees. So you would expect if it was acute. So for instance, in Ontario this year and Germany three years ago, when they were, that they were, they were planting corn, they had coated the corn, and the corn wasn't, it, the paint that sticks the insecticide to the corn wasn't on right. It came out in a cloud dust and it landed on the bees and the bee colonies in a classic way, tons and tons of dead bees. As you know, the problem is, and a lot of people argue, well, neonicotinoids aren't causing acute mortality, they're causing sub-lethal um, sub mortality. And so that becomes a much more difficult question to answer. And I think that it's, it's, it's a matter, there's been some work this year, the French came out with something that showed, oh yeah, you can get bees, that it increases their mortality rate, and that they made a model. There's been a lot of pushback on the model. The model was designed to show colony collapse disorder, where it wasn't related to the biology of the bees at all. So I think that there's a lot of controversy and difficulty in figuring that out, as, as you know. Um, I think that there is evidence that at low levels, and I think that this is, at high levels it's pretty clear that these aren't causing a lot of problems. So after it gets a, a certain level, that we don't have a lot of evidence. It seems only to be a problem at some very, very low levels. It's as if the bees haven't yet figured out, oh, I better start detoxifying. And so there's this really low level that seems that the bees are much more susceptible to other diseases. The question remains, and I think this is an important one, is do we see that for other pesticides, or is this unique to imidacloprid? Everyone, right now, if you want to get a big name, you have to prove imidacloprid is the cause of all mortality. And so everyone studying imidacloprid, what's being ignored in a lot of cases are fungicides and herbicides and these other things. And the evidence there is much bigger. 
and that the evidence there that those are causing some problems are much greater than for men of focus. I think that that has to do with acute, acute mortality. So if you suddenly have a bee that can't find a home, it's acutely dead. So I think that that's more on the acute side. I think it's that sub, the sublethal argument, I think, so far as I know, the sublethal argument is around its inability to fight common infection. And, and I think it's a very legitimate argument that needs more work. But it seems that that only happens at very low levels. It doesn't tend to happen at some of the higher levels. Also, the work that has shown a lot of this stuff has all happened where you're seeing demonstrated effects. All of those demonstrated effects are occurring at levels that are beyond, are higher than we actually have measured in the field. There's one unpublished study that that isn't the case, but in, in all the published studies, the, the amount that's been exposed to the bees and, and shows an effect has been higher than what you measure in the field. It's a very complicated, there's no question it's a complicated thing, but I do think, and I, I, we had a long discussion before, so I'm painting this, I do, I, I do think that the attention on imidacloprids has distracted from the growing body of evidence that's shown some of these other things that are much more common and much more manageable from the imidacloprid, like fungicides and like some of these herbicides and like some of the inert, some of the things that the, the pesticide companies mix with the active ingredient have an effect on bees. And no one has looked at that at all. So I think there's a lot more than this, than this sort of hidden, very mysterious, no one can nail down. There's a lot of things we can nail down that we're ignoring. And, and I worry that the attention is going on a middle corporate, where there's a lot of other stuff going on. Well, so there's some work. I, um, there's some work that's shown that some herbicides can have a measurable effect on how cells grow in bees. So it's a very lab assay sort of thing. Whether that means anything in the real world, who knows? But there's some of some of that going on. Right. Well, and certainly that's that's the big issue, is that sometimes 1 plus 1 isn't 2. Sometimes 1 plus 1 is 27. And, and, and that's the concern. Sometimes you have an exposure here that in itself is benign, an exposure here that's benign, but the two of them coming together isn't. Um, and there's a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. This, this is changing weekly. Um, and I think it can be overwhelming. But I do think, and I think this is the important message, is that I am convinced that most of the problems beekeepers are faced with are manageable. We can manage these, we can manage a lot of our losses with what we know. You need to treat for varroa, you need to make sure your bees are well fed, that includes protein in the fall, and you need to control for nosema if you have a problem. I think doing these issues, I think, helps a lot, and I think a majority of our losses, not all of our losses, but I think the majority of our losses would be reduced. In this, in this obvious and backyard beekeeper sideline operation, I think the commercial beekeepers are a little bit different and their problems are a little different. But I think us in this room, most of us, can manage most of our mortality problems. Well, if you have a question. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that I think our understanding of, for a while it was Nosema apis, which is really clear because it causes a lot of diarrhea on the hive. Then there was this dry Nosema, Nosema serrana. Last year, National Honeybee Disease Survey, we couldn't find barely any Nosema serrana. So it seems to be these alternating two species. I think that you can get very high levels. I don't think we know nearly enough about Nosema as we should. We used to say a million spores per bee. That doesn't seem to be the case. So I really think the nosema is a little bit fudgy. 
If you have a lot of dysentery in your apiary, I think you treat with fumagillin. If you're not seeing a lot of dysentery, don't worry about it. Do you think that the bees can um, develop So homeowners do a lot 
It, like when you build it up, these little drops mean an awful lot. And so the pesticide use in, in things, like you can't, for instance, grow vegetables on many golf courses because they would be toxic for all the, the heavy metals and all the other things there. So it's the homeowner environment that's much more toxic than a lot of these um, rural, urban, rural environments. All right, thank you.